So, uh, today we will discuss about chest x-ray in uh, diagnosing various cardiac diseases from basics to advanced. So, today we will start with the basics of interpretation of chest x-ray also. So, uh, chest x-ray should be interpreted as a 10-step protocol. So, that is initially we have to look at the technical part. That is we use it right protocol. It will come to it. Then uh, check what is the view and the bony cage and soft tissue uh, relations. Uh, any, abnorm any abnormalities are there or not. Then the green shaded area denotes the cardiac part per se. That is, we have to look at the situs, whether there is any cardiomegaly. Look at the cardiac sillet, that is, cardiac sillet, that is, we have to look for any chamber enlargements, all the four chamber enlargements. Then look at the pulmonary blood flow. Then Look at if there is any pulmonary venous or pulmonary arterial hypertension. And then lastly, the lung parenting. So first we look at the technical uh, quality. So look at the technical quality, we have to follow the right protocol or the uh, R stands for rotation, inspiration, projection and exposure. So all these four things should be looked initially. So coming to the rotation first. So, uh, typically there should not be any rotation. So, to look at rotation, we are, it is like uh, the uh, clavicle, the medial end of the clavicle should be equidistant from the spine forces of the vertebra. The vertebral spine should be equidistant if it is uh, rotated like that. And another way to look at it, if, suppose if it is rotated to the left, the pulmonary bay will be more prominent. And if there is rotation to the right, the ascending aorta will be more prominent. That is another way to look at other features to look at rotation then if it is rotated to one side that is if it is rotated to the left that side of the lung will be more translucent or it will be hyper translucent so that side of the lung will be looking more black so all these three features can help us uh, determine the rotation coming to inspiration typically chest x-ray should be obtained in full inspiration so uh, inspiration yeah, uh, sir, uh, rotation, rotation, inspiration, inspiration, penetration, and exposure, uh, projection and exposure. So that is about rotation. Now coming. Then we look at the general clavicle. At times, sir, at this medial end of the clavicle and all will not be very discernible. At that point, we can look for additional points of That is. Lung So, coming to inspiration, uh, they uh, should be obtained in full inspiration. So, a good, if it's a good inspiratory film, so this is very important in uh, cardiac x rays. So cardiac x rays should be in a full inspiratory film because otherwise it may show a apparent cardiomegaly or a thing that. Uh, Heart size will be having a difference. So uh, this is the posterior rib which we see, which is more wider, and the anterior rib is just uh, uh, behind that, uh, in front of that. So good inspiratory film should have six anterior ribs, six anterior ribs, and ten posterior ribs. So that is how this is. So these are the six uh, anterior ribs rounded and the ten posterior ribs. 
So if there is a less number of reps, it denotes a poor inspiratory effort. And if there are more reps, that is, if it is more than six in anterior and more than ten posterior, it uh, suggests that it's a hyperinflated plant. We have to uh, look for the COPD and look for COPD. So what are the problems with an expiratory film? If we obtain obstetric film, it can show a false cardiomegaly, it can show widening of iota, prominent pulmonary artery, and a false spectral deviation. But there are certain situations when we take an expiratory film also. That is, if there is such a small pneumonia, if you ask for a deep breath around, uh, the pneumonia uh, can, can progress, uh, it can help in progression of pneumonia. So, in a small pneumonia and a foreign body aspiration also, we, do, we take a expiratory filler in which the deep inspiration will be bad for the patient now coming to the projection so uh, typically cardiac usually we uh, want a pa projection ap projection is turn, uh, taken for to look for any bony abnormality factors and all so projection can be a frontal projection which can be ap and pa lateral projection and a uh, erect and supine also and like a uh, uh, portable x-ray we take in a ap projection so uh, the difference in a PA and a AP projection, these are the major differences. The heart will be smaller in a PA projection, whereas uh, or, or a normal size PA projection, whereas there will be a 5 to 10% increase in the cardiac size in a AP projection. The cardiac size cannot be determined in a AP projection. The contour will be very accurate in a PA projection, whereas it is hazy. Cardiac contours of the cylinder will be hazy in a AP. Clavicles will be V-shaped, like V shaped, both the clavicles will be coming down like that, whereas it will be horizontal in a AP projection. Then, in a uh, PA projection, we don't see the scapular border. Scapula uh, will be outside the lung field, whereas in an AP projection, the scapula will be within the lung field. That is another difference. Then, the ribs in a AP, the ribs will be with a uh, PA will be oblique, whereas in a AP, the ribs will be almost horizontal. This is not that typical of horizontal, but in a typical AP, it will be very horizontal. Then the vertebral spine will be very prominent. The spines of this uh, vertebral body will be very prominent in a PA, whereas in a AP, it is the vertebral body that is more prominent. That is the text used in. Then uh, PA projection usually taken uh, with the patient direct. It's horizontal. horizontal. The ribs will be horizontal. Whereas here, ribs will be uh, oblique. Then there will be apparent cardiomegaly in a AP, but this is that is not there in a PA. Then the uh, uh, vertebral spine will uh, in vertebra the spine is prominent in a PA, whereas in a AP the spine is not that prominent, but the body will be more prominent. Then uh, PA typically we take in an erect posture, so we can see uh, the fundus gastric shadow. So the, the we can see the gastric shadow that will be present in the fundus of the stomach. Whereas in the AP, it will be more in the antrum of the stomach. When the, uh, the gastric shadow, it will be more towards the bot, uh, lower part of the stomach in the AP. Because AP, like uh, uh, when we are taking in a, uh, uh, this thing, supine posture, uh, bedside x-ray when we are taking, the frontal gastric should be in the antrum. Then the clavicle and the first rib will override in a PA projection. The clavicle and the first rib, whereas that will not be there in the AP projection. And a clavicle companion shadow will be present in a PA projection, that, that will be absent in a AP projection. So these are the uh, differences, just for uh, probably for exams, all these points. It is important for an exam. Normally, what we first talk about the vertebral spine wrong. So one, the direction of the ribs. That is oblique versus horizontal. The number of ribs. Six. Six, uh, uh, six anterior, ten posterior. Ten posterior. If you see it like this, you can see number of the total angular and from here you have to look at the width from back to front. Nine six seven. Number and then. Sir, the number is our number. Uh, inspiratory film mark. Ah, that one open. A P P le. Is it like a gas
this will be uh, more of a horizontal, but either a typical AP or less, right? Okay. So, for sure, okay. horizontal line. Okay. Okay. Yes. So, important thing is, uh, you should not access the cardiac size from an AP. So, it, is, it will have an apparent cardiac number. So, coming to the exposure. So, uh, typically, a good penetration should show the first four vertebral bodies should be seen. Whereas, if it's under penetrated, no vertebral bodies will be seen. And it's over penetrated, the entire vertebral body along the entire thing will be seen. That is how we assess the exposure. So, here we can see it's an over penetrated film, the entire vertebral body will be seen. Whereas, in an under penetrated, the, uh, all the first four will not be seen, less than four will be seen. So, for a good pair, this thing, the first four vertebral bodies should be well seen. That is a good exposure. So now we will come to a normal X. So that was the technical aspect, uh, uh, the right protocol which we have to look at uh, initially. Now we will come to the normal X-ray. So uh, we will be knowing the parts of a, a normal X-ray, gastric shadow angle, the cardiophrenic angle, the postophrenic angle, left heart border, right heart border. Okay. So what are the structures seen in the anterior view? So here we have the uh, left heart border and the right heart border. The left heart border, the structures forming, we have the aortic arch, then we have the pulmonary tongue, otherwise called the pulmonary bay, if it is uh, not occupied, the pulmonary bay we are coming in detail. Then below that we have the left fatal appendage, LV and the apex. On the right heart... In between the pulmonary tongue and the left fatal one more structure and that is the right one we are observing. Are we observing? looking at the acute margin of the heart and the obtuse margin of the heart. So the right margin is called as acute margin because it was creates an acute cardiophonic angle with the diaphragm. Whereas the left is the, called as the obtuse margin of the heart because it creates an obtuse cardiophonic angle with the uh, heart, but with the diaphragm. So when we are looking at the frontal X-ray PA view, there are seven cardiac contours which we have to look at uh, uh, and in detail we have to look. That is the contour of the aortic node or the aortic muscle, the main pulmonary artery, the indentation for the left atrium or the left atrial appendage, then the left ventricle, then the ascending aorta here, then the LA, double density of the LA contour can, can come here and the right atrial contour. So all these seven cardiac contours we will we should look at carefully. And now what is the cardiac silhouette? The word silhouette means uh, this is called as a silhouette picture. So you can understand that it will be a representation of the outlines of an object filled in with a black color, a profile portrait in black, such as a shadow appears to be. So this is a silhouette. So that is why we have given the to identify the borders of the heart. It's called as a cardiac silhouette. So, uh, just to refresh, the structures forming the left heart, aortic knuckle, main pulmonary artery, the pulmonary bay, a left atrial appendage if it is enlarged, and the left ventricle, and then the cardiac apex. Then uh, RVOT as a tool. 
can come between the pulmonary artery and the left atrial appendix. So we have seen all the three chambers. So where did the LA go? So the left atrium is not generally seen uh, on a frontal X-ray. If it is not, unless it's not enlarged. So this is the area where. So it will be exactly behind the so in the PA view. So this is the area where the left atrium will be sitting. So it is exactly behind, as you can see in the CT. This is the CT uh, coronal uh, section. We can see the left atrium to be the posterior most structure, and it is close to the vertebral spine. So it will be uh, in and around this area. So if it is enlarging, it will enlarge superiorly uh, and posteriorly. That is how the LA enlarges. So it can enlarge in this way and this way. When it's very big only, it comes to the right side of the head. So, uh, same just to show the border. So, uh, uh, now we will come to the lateral view. What are the, how do, what the structures we see in the lateral view? So, this is the lateral view of the x ray. So, the anterior most structure we see is the right ventricle. So, this part will the uh, anterior external border, uh, one third of that will be occupied by the right ventricle, whereas the remaining retrosternal space. Because otherwise, the two third will be a retrosternal space that will not be occupied normally, but only one third will be occupied by the RV. If the uh, uh, other one third is also occupied, then we can say that is RV enlargement. If the uh, upper part of this retrosternal space is occupied, even in RA enlargement, that can be occupied. So, these are the we divide this retro space into three parts one third, one third, one third. So, one third will be normally occupied by the ventricle. Other will be occupied in RV enlargement and the top most will be enlarged in RA enlargement. The consultancy, this is the reason why we say that for ventricular enlargement, the ideal view is The reason is always the RV enlarges your anterior mm -hmm. and the LV enlarges posterior. Uh, and inferior. Posterior, that means. Uh, RV means the retrosternal spare, that's some air in between the heart and the, uh, the that's a retrosternal space. That is obliterated and the RV moves over to the sternum. What I know. But when the LV moves, it moves posteriorly, it, over, it may even overlap the sternum. Right. LV may uh, occupy this space and, and, and it may come down. It may come down and find it for the kidney. Yeah, find the further can beyond this. Yeah. Actually, we will we'll discuss all the grades of enlargement. There are three grades of that and LV enlargement uh, okay. with regard to the spine. That also is. And the LV will enlarge downwards. So that is uh, when when it enlarges downwards, only we get this LV apex dipping down below the diaphragm in the frontal PA region. So these are the structures. The anterior most is the RV. The major part is the LV. We may see an inferior vena cava here. So, uh, the inferior vena cava will be entering the, uh, it will be, uh, it should be seen here, which which is entering the right atrium, which is behind this structure. So, this inferior vena cava is important because it will help us in uh, uh, taking a regulus A, regulus B, uh, some value survey, which we will discuss about uh, that is uh, with that value, we will be able to differentiate right ventricular enlargement from left ventricular enlargement and grading of enlargement, that is regular so, so that calculation will come. So the IVC is important, but this IVC may not be seen in all cases, but whenever it's seen, we can take this regular or regular B measurement. So that is IVC, we have to, this thing it will be there, and all the other structures. So that is in a lateral view. Another picture just showing all the lateral views, IVC will be like this, and uh, all the other. Retrosternal space, one third will be occupied, the other two third will be filled. So, coming to cardiomegaly, now how do we determine cardiomegaly in a PA chest X ray? Important is its cardiothoracic uh, ratio, we all know. So, it is uh, from the midline, we draw a straight line, and from there, the maximum outer border of the right, right heart border. From that point to this point, we have to make a measurement, and the maximum outer point of the left heart border from there to this point. So that is A and B. So A plus B. This A plus B uh, should be more than uh, less than 55 percent normally. Yeah, it's not 50. Actually, it's actually 55 percent. And this value is different for depending on the age. So in newborns, it should uh, it should uh, to determine to say that it's cardiomegaly, it should be more than 70 percent. In infants, it should be more than 65 percent. 
in children it should be more than 60% and adolescents 55 and adults around 50 to 55 50 to 55 in adults so uh, so that is how we determine the cardio if it's cardiomegaly or not so these are the values and if there is emphysema, emphysema, we know that there is a, if the heart will be pushed by the lung, so it will be a tubular heart. So this fits, even if there is cardiomegaly, it will be the effect of the uh, inflated lung will affect the cardiomegaly. So, so in emphysema, we take an absolute value. That is not, uh, we can, we have to take an absolute value. That is, this A plus B should be more than 15.5 in a males and more than 12.5 in females. So absolute value should be taken to determine cardiomegaly in MPC. So grading of uh, cardiomegaly with from this, it is, it is 50 to 57, it is slight, but there is definite cardiomegaly, slight cardiomegaly. There. 57 to 65, there is obvious cardiomegaly, and more than 65, it is gross cardiomegaly. So that is the grading based on that. And we can also determine the cardiac volume also. This is not routinely done, but just for uh, academic interest. That is, we have to calculate the length and the breadth of the uh, cardiac cylinder, and the the depth can be measured from the lateral view. So we have length, the breadth, and the width. So uh, from that length, breadth, and width, we can calculate the volume of the heart from a chest X-ray. And uh, uh, based on that volume, normally the volume should be less than 550. We can grade it, the volume. If it is more than uh, 900, it is grade three cardiomegaly. That is based on the cardiac volume. So that is uh, cardiac cardiomegaly by cardiac volume. Now uh, we may see certain false elevation of cardiomegaly. So the causes of spurious cardiomegaly is if you take a AP view, it will be a five to ten percent apparent cardiomegaly will be there. Obesity, pregnancy, ascites, then uh, the skeletal abnormalities like straight back syndrome and factor six skeletal. So these are the other spurious causes of cardiomegaly. <laughs> Uh, I think, sir, uh, because of uh, more fluid, maybe ray diversions, x ray diversions. So we cannot get a, a good inspirator field. That process So now we'll go into the individual chamber enlargements, the criteria to diagnose individual chamber enlargements from X-ray. One is the right atrial enlargement. So uh, right atrial enlargement criteria, we have a vertical criteria as well as a horizontal criteria. So vertical criteria is, if the right, this is the right atrial border, if that border, if it is more than two interpostal space, or if it is more than three ribs, if it occupies more than three ribs or two intercostal space, we can say it's right atrial enlargement. Or if the vertical height, uh, if this right atrial uh, length, that diameter, uh, we have to actually trace and measure that length. So if that is more than 50% of the vertical height of the heart, that is from the base, that is from the iota, iota tip, the arch of iota, to the dome of the diaphragm where the heart sits. So that we can take as a vertical height of the heart. So if it is more than 50% of the vertical height of the heart, then we can say that there is right atrial enlargement. So these are the three vertical criteria for a right atrial enlargement. Now the horizontal criteria is, uh, we have we can draw a, a midline, a vertical line mid, uh, in the middle of the spine. So from that line, if the outermost right atrial border, if it is uh, beyond 5.5 centimeter, it is 5.5 uh, centimeter, or if we if we are drawing a line from the lateral border of the spine, if it is beyond 3.5 centimeter, so if that distance uh, from the lateral vertebral border, if it's more than 3.5, or from the mid vertebral border, it is more than 5.5, we can say it's a right atrial enlargement. Uh, other thing is, if the right atrium is occupying more than one third of the right hemithorax, if this entire right hemithorax, if it's occupying more than one third of the, we can say right atrial enlargement. And if the, uh, this is, I already told, the right atrial convexity, if it's more than 50% of the cardiovascular effect. So that is the horizontal and the vertical criteria for right atrial enlargement. Then, in a lateral view, we have discussed earlier. Right, right, right. 
ഇതിന്റെ ചില സ്പെസിഫിക് ചെയ്യുന്ന ഇന്റർകോസ്റ്റൽ സ്പേസ് ആയിരിക്കും DCM all four chambers will be enlarged. So, so will be endospheric pressure elevation. RV left. You can argue it out two ways. DCM can involve the right one with the oh. And then can be used to PR and RV. Uh, or right one with the oh. alien and RV. So, what we should remember is this time in the screen line. Then uh, coming to LA enlargement. So 
So, we are seeing that LA is the posterior most structure and the LA can enlarge only posteriorly and superior. So, it can enlarge in this direction. LA will enlarge in this direction. So, what happens is if LA, LA enlarges in the, this direction, it will push this left bronchus up. So, that can cause the carinal angle. So, we know this is the carinal angle, angle produced by both the bronchus. So, so that can be pushed up and the left uh, bronchus can be made elevated at the horizontal. And then, uh, because of the LA enlargement, the left atrial appendage also uh, enlarges. So, that can cause a straightening of the left heart border. The left atrial appendage, uh, if it is mild uh, LA appendage enlargement, it will cause straightening. If it is more than that, it will cause a prominent left atrial appendage. Even after straightening, it may come out of the left heart border. Then, after that only, we see the uh, left atrial, uh, double atrial shadow that is seen on the right side. So we can see a double atrial shadow on the right side and uh, the other thing is we can see in a barium swallow so uh, because this la enlargement is uh, more posteriorly it can compress the esophagus which is behind and it will display that ascending aorta to the left uh, to the left and esophagus to the right the picture will see so one thing is the widening of the carinal angle normal carinal angle is with less than 75 so it is if it is more than 75 we can call it as a Widening of the carinal angle. Here in a left atrial enlargement, carinal angle is 102. Next is, uh, and the uh, bronchus also will be elevated. Then the straightening, or uh, even it can come out of the left heart border by the left atrial appendage. Prominent left atrial appendage, or it can be even straightened. The other is a double atrial shadow. You can see a uh, left atrial shadow here along with the right atrial shadow. So there are a grading of this uh, left atrial enlargement based on this double atrial shadow so on then on uh, barium solo uh, we can see that the uh, left displacement of the descending thoracic aorta this, because of it will be the more towards the left the descending thoracic aorta will be pushed more towards left and the esophagus will be pushed more towards the right side so here we can see there is a entity called a dysphagia megalatrinsis or cardiac dysphagia that is seen in huge left atrial enlargement in which the enlarged left atrium will press on the esophagus causing dysphagia for the patient. So it's called as a, if it is compressing, it's called as a Ashworth set. So the, now coming to the grading of LLA enlargement, if you are, if you are just seeing the double atrial shadow, it can be grade 1. If that left atrial shadow touches the right atrial shadow, that is, it is almost overlapping like that is grade 2 and if it crosses the right atrial shadow, it is LA crosses the RA, it is grade 3. Those are the three grades of left atrial enlargement. There is, can be a situation in which the, the left the, can be called as an aneurysmal left atrium in which few, very huge left atrial enlargement in which the uh, in, uh, left atrium will enlarge towards both the sides of the chest x-ray, leaving only hardly any half to one inch on either side of the chest x-ray. So this is, in this scenario, we can call it as a aneurysmal left atrial enlargement. So that is about the left atrial enlargement. Now coming to a left ventricular enlargement. On an AP view, uh, we can see that the uh, left heart border at this, at the apex, it will dip down below the diaphragm. So this uh, cardiac border will be going even below the diaphragm. That is because the uh, LV, you know, it's posterior most. So when it enlarges, it will uh, initially enlarge posteriorly and then it will go down in inferiorly. So at that point, the apex will be seen dipping down uh, into the left dome of the head. and it will be more of a rounded leg, rounded and uh, the cardiophrenic angle will be obtuse. In a lateral view, uh, we can see that that uh, space will be occupied by the left ventricle uh, that we have. Uh, Three vertebral space level will occupy and it will enlarge inferiorly and the posterior. So, this is uh, uh, the criteria. Uh, older method uh, called the Regulus method to determine the RV enlargement. It is actually used to differentiate between LV and RV enlargement. Uh, difficult to do, but it is of academic interest. So, the principle is that on a lateral, it is done, it is done only in a lateral chest x ray. So, if the distance between the left ventricular border and the posterior border of the IVC exceeds 1.8 centimeters. 
so uh, I'll, I'll just tell how it is done so we can do this regular me measurement only if ivc we can see on a lateral chest x-ray so on a lateral view we have seen that the ivc will be entering uh, from below up so what we have to do is the junction of this ivc with the uh, left atrium that we can call it as the uh, the ivc this will be the direction of the ivc so uh, that ivc if we are along the course of the ivc if we draw a line upward towards the uh, left atrium it will intersect at a point so that point we call as a j point so from this j point we have to draw another a two centimeter line upwards two centimeter line upwards uh, along the track of the ivc so that line uh, we have to draw so this is that two centimeter line and the end of the two centimeter is a point called we mark it as x and from x we have to draw a uh, horizontal line towards a posterior aspect that will be the y so this x y the distance between x and y is called as the regular a so normally this value is less than 17 mm and if it is more than 17 mm we can call it as a lv enlargement and uh, if it is less it could be rv enlargement also that is regular a and the regular b is we know this j point from that j point we have to draw a downward uh, a line downwards towards the dome of the diaphragm so that is this line towards the dome so this distance is called as regular b so that should be normally more than 7.5 cm so this this is the regular a and regular b method for uh, diagnosing uh, left ventricular enlargement why all these measurements can because lv is a difficult uh, more difficult to say our enlargement in the pa that's why in the measurements are important to show the extra product so again you are getting direct measurement so that is the regular a and regular b vertical height and the x y distance this is shadow clear so in case when we cannot see the ivc shadow uh, then we use the eulers ratio eulers ratio is simple that is the point where the uh, cardiac border touches the dome of the diaphragm is taken as a point b and we will draw a horizontal line back and front so that we get a b and the b c so normally the ratio of a b by b c should be less than 0.4 that is the idler ratio. Then uh, this is in LA oblique view also we can uh, um, this, uh, we can say about LV enlargement. That is this will become important when we do fluoroscopy in angiogram. So uh, we can approximately tell the LV enlargement because we have told that the LV enlarges posteriorly and inferiorly. So there can be a grading. That is, if there is the we you know there will be a retrocardiac space here so if there is my uh, lv enlarges if there is mild obliteration of the uh, retrocardiac space it can be a mild uh, mild lv enlargement if it overlaps the vertebral column it can be moderate and if it comes overshoots the vertebral column it is severe lv that we can say approximately on a la oblique view during fluoroscopy in here so that is lv enlargement now we'll come over to rv enlargement so rv enlargement it will cause an acute uh, uh, cardiophrenic angle and on right lateral view it's a different that is the obliteration of this retrocardial space that is the middle third will be obliterated or even above that and uh, in a left lateral view uh, the regular A will be less than 70, regular B will be more than 7.5, and eyeless ratio will be less than 0.5. This is to, just to differentiate RB from LP. So, that was about the, all the chamber enlargements. Now, we come to the pulmonary vascularity. So, pulmonary vascularity can be normal, it can be increased in a scenario which we call as pulmonary plethora, and it can be decreased in a scenario we call as pulmonary oligemia. This plethora and oligemia apply to what? So, uh, what is normal? That is normal is uh, this uh, right in a uh, AP view, we can see the right descending pulmonary artery well. So, the normally in a person, the right descending pulmonary artery which should be less than 70 number. That is normal. 
So uh, from in initially we'll discuss about pulmonary venous hypertension. So pulmonary venous hypertension, you know, the lactatal pressure rises. It will reflect on the pulmonary veins, and like that it will. Reflect. So uh, there are a grading of uh, pulmonary venous hypertension that is based on the pressure in the left atrium or the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. So normally the pulmonary capillary blood pressure left atrium should be less than zero, so that uh, there is no pulmonary venous hypertension, or we can say it is normal or zero. Uh, in grade 1, 2, and 3, what happens is grade 1 is just a redistribution that is from blood from the lower uh, uh, this uh, upper vessels, uh, upper lung fields will be more common in redistribution. In grade 2, we can see call it as interstitial edema, and grade 3, it is frank alveolar edema and frank pulmonary edema. Because of the elevated pressure. Master construction. Um, there are various theories regarding this uh, release. One has to say when the blood flow can be see when there is pulmonary venous hypertension, what happens is that the uh, the, the forces will tend to push the uh in the interstitial, that is the capital hydrostatic pressure. That increases. That's the increase. The plasma on the on topic pressure drives the fluid into the into the blood cell. Yeah. It's really to it's a gap of hydrostatic pressure. So when the uh, venous pressure right the hydrostatic pressure also rises. Hydrostatic pressure. Yeah, it rises and this pushes the blood into the fluid into the interstitial. So earlier you get interstitial edema, then followed by alveolar. Alveolar. The interstitial edema, alveolar, coronal, and nectum. Uh, the initial phase, the upper low vessels are not open. So okay. even in normal human beings, the upper low vessels are not open unless there is requirement. For example, exercise education. So you need more uh, oxygen requirement. At that time, it can open. Normally, they are in a state of slightly constricted state. They are not, they don't receive. There is some alveolar perfusion mist and penetration perfusion mist and the upper room. This, this this here is called Jordan hypertension. So what happens is when this there is interstitial edema, long-standing interstitial edema leads to one is vasoconstriction, the other is leads to fibrosis. So if fibrosis of coronal nectum very it, it affects the vessels also. So all these vessels are also fibrous. So you have a lesser amount of patent vessels in the lower. Upper and upper zone vessels are starting to fill up. Fill up. So that is a redistribution. So the normal X ray leg in a redistribution of upper low vessels are prominent in the level, and you are not seeing the lower low vessels as clearly as the upper zone. So that is the reason. This is called Jordan Jordan this is the reason long standing industrial edema leads to vasoconstriction as well as due to because when there is the fluid to everybody, the amount of ventilation in the alveolar element void, the fluid is compulsive. Lung in the character is boiled, lung is a spongy tissue. The moment you have fluid, the spongy character is lost and becomes more or less solid. It's like sponge in the water. Yeah. The, the, the part of the, suppose you mix a sponge in the water, the lower part of it is soaked, it will have a different consistency when compared to the, the sponge in the, above the water. The same thing. Powder removes that this uh, leads to vasoconstriction, stimulates vasoconstriction, you call it hypoxia. You know, that in the ventilation, maybe it's gas exchange and outcome of the After that, stimulates vasoconstriction and also obliteration of the vessels, long standing vessel fibrosis. A whole lung tissue and a fibrosis. And then the powder vessels. For that to compensate the upper low vessels. So that is why you get redistribution. That's the earliest period. 
പിന്നെ
Here I uh, have put up as a, uh, the universe, we discussed pounding capital less than here it is kept as or it can be told in terms of a mean pressure also. So mean pressure after 20, uh, 20 to 30 and more than 30. So more than 30, prime problem So grade 1, we see the prominence of the upper lobe wings or otherwise called as satellization or otherwise called as antlers. Upturned moustache sign. Uh, up -turned moustache sign. So antler's horn sign. So antler is this deer like so it resembles the horn of this in the upper lobe. So that is why it's called as an antler's horn sign. Then in the upper uh, first intercostal space, if the vessel diameter more than 3 mm also it can be seen. Then upper lobe vein, the upper lobe pulmonary diameter will be equal to the lower lobe diameter. Or it can be just put a this thing like this. Just put a line like this. Just look at the vascular. That used to be a very simple way of looking at it. That is a redistribution. Lower it is redistribution. So there is see, a, see this x-ray actually the anger horn sign is much seen clearly seen on the left side. Super this side compared to the right. Uh, the uh, branching okay. part uh, branching side. This it one. is better seen on the left side than on the right. Right. But you look at the lower zone, hardly any vascular. So this is the easiest way of looking at the jet x-ray and saying that there is really seen. Then uh, we can see upturned moustache sign. Then, then, then. Same that I See, only thing is the after moustache sign one line there is that same You have the arc like this. You have RP again. The you have seen the most prominent person is the descending RP. Here what happens is this is reverse moustache sign. Normally the moustache is like this. So you put and change the direct or not to the vascularity correct. The upper same e clump than the other. Normally your okay, vascular is coming down. Right yeah, upper pulmonary vein and left upper pulmonary vein is strong. That is it is same. Okay. It is the same. Antler horn sign the word made a reverse moustache sign the orange one over the road. Antler horn ling in a spread deal of water at the corner. Deal portion of the larger vessel size from the same. It's another name for antler horn. Then uh, loss of visibility of the mid day and the distal descending pulmonary okay. artery. And the other is effacement of the hilar angle. That will come on the next slide. So there is this. Uh, what happens is this yes, the side and it was 79 actor 148 <laughs> 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 I think I have a very good idea. 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 I have so we know that the uh, superior, uh, the right pulmonary vein, the size of this pulmonary vein keeps on enlarging. 
So normally this pulmonary vein will create an angle with the descending pulmonary artery. So this angle is the hilar angle. So what happens is as this pulmonary vein size increases, that hilar angle will be obliterated. It becomes more or less straight. And at one point can even come out of like that. So that is the hilar angle. So that obliteration is what defacement of that. That hilar angle becomes more or less straight because of this pulmonary vein being enlarged. It is we call as a defacement of the hilar angle. Then grade 2 uh, curly lines we see that this next slide we discuss about all the curly lines. Next slide. Next one. Yeah, that's what I'm ready. Three. And next one. Next one. Next one. Next one. Uh, narrow vascular pedicle. How to differentiate cardiogenic versus non cardiogenic? We don't have an expert here, but they are seeing the ED. So, roll out if it's cardiogenic or non cardiogenic. You are a pretty good cardiogenic. Patient with the I 